So, so thanks very much. Welcome to the Clang, GCC, Binutils, GNU Linker, uh, LLD uh, session and mini conference here. We're going to have a couple of interesting presentations about uh, the GNU toolchain and the LLVM toolchain and the interaction with the, the Linux kernel. So uh, the first talk is by me. My name is David Edelson. I'm on the GCC steering committee and I also work at IBM Research. I'm the PowerPC port maintainer. Uh, and so uh, let's dive right into it. Uh, as, as everybody knows, uh, we'll talk about that this is a, a tribute to the GNU band. I mean, it started out in the 1960s, as you remember, as a Hootenanny band, and then uh, in the, turned into a rock band in the 1970s. This was the, 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 the rough phrase, that's Richard Stallman on the left there. And then after going to Rishikesh, he then went, returned to MIT and founded the GNU toolchain movement and the GNU project in general. Uh, so that's the brief history of the GNU. But seriously, uh, the GNU toolchain is the tool chain of the Linux kernel. I mean, it's, it's the tool chain that for the, it compiles the Linux kernel, it compiles the user space for the uh, Linux distributions, and it's the tool chain that most of the major distributions are using to build the entire infrastructure. Uh, so it's quite important to the Linux community, and we want to discuss uh, and remind everybody how uh, GCC and Binutils and all of the toolchain interacts with Linux and what are the uh, dependencies of Linux on the GNU toolchain and dependencies of the GNU toolchain on Linux. Um, so basically Linux distro ABIs are defined by GCC and glibc, uh, libgcc, libstandard C++. This is what uh, is uh, locked in in most Linux distributions as uh, that, that sets, again, the ABI that defines uh, and is reason that, that provides the forward compatibility of Linux distributions within a particular release. A long-term uh, supported release of Linux basically doesn't change these components. You'll, there'll be add-ons, there'll be additional tool sets, but this is the basic level that we don't change, that Linux distributions don't change in order to provide that level of stability for all the projects, all the packages that are running on the system. Um, and as, you know, for a Linux distribution, 99% or more of the packages in a distribution, the executables, that's over 5,000 packages, and for instance, Red Hat Enterprise Linux or uh, SUSE, are built with GCC. So GCC and bin utils are really defining what a Linux distribution is. <clears throat> Here is an, an eye chart, but just describing to remind people of how much uh, these tools are the, the foundation of the Linux distribution. I mean, everything from the kernel itself, KVM Zen, glibc, obviously, but bash, init, tech, emacs, uh, Python, and all the different applications that are built on Python from OpenStack to uh, TensorFlow, Keras, PyTorch, Perl, Diff, Git, all these pieces are built with GCC, all these libraries that are very fundamental. <clears throat> International libraries, the uh, BZIP libraries, uh, GDBM, uh, OpenBLAS, Atlas for, for math libraries, all of this is built with the GNU toolchain. And so this is very important to the current cloud and machine learning, AI deep learning infrastructure, and this is what the GNU toolchain is contributing to the environment and the ecosystem that, that Linux provides. So GCC is, uh, you know, has a lot of really great resources, a lot of really great capabilities. It produces very fast executables now. It produces small executables. I mean, it produces good debugging information to be able to really understand what's going on in an application when it's not working. The diagnostics are now very, very good uh, with a lot of improvements that uh, a lot of competition from other tool chains. I mean, Clang has, has you know, really stepped up its game and stepped up the, the game of the GNU tool chain as well. And GCC's compilation is, has again been driven to, be, to improve a lot. So it's really a very good, robust, uh, fast, flexible tool chain that is providing the basis for all of this you know, use in the enterprise, in the cloud, in on-premises, in hybrid cloud and public clouds. Uh, it's really the basis for a lot of what is happening in the, the use of Linux. Uh, GCC has a wide variety of support. I mean, to remind people, the languages, obviously C and C++, 
Fortran, Objective-C, Objective-C++, Goeda, D language was just added a, a few months ago. Uh, it's now available. I mean, there's other sort of secondary languages that aren't public, but uh, COBOL, PL.8. Architectures are supported. Again, obviously, x86, ARM, PowerPC, uh, a lot of you know, other architectures from FRV, Epiphany. Uh, I'm mentioning there at the end this uh, NDS32 and CSKY, which were just added to the Linux kernel. They're now just available in Linux, and they are, Linux is able to provide those architectures because the GNU toolchain provides those architectures. So it's the basis for all of the you know, breadth and depth and portability of it. Uh, OSs, obviously it supports many additional OSs embedded in addition to, to Linux, but the primary focus of this conference is Linux, so I'll just sort of leave that. But, you know, ZOS, TPF, you know, all of the BSDs, it's a very, very, you know, general, productive, portable tool chain that, uh, you know, provides a lot of uh, robustness for everybody who's using it. Uh, what was GCC is a very actively developed, actively maintained infrastructure. You have the recent work in, in a, a JIT now is available with libgcc JIT. Uh, again, debugging improvements are, are excellent. Unit testing infrastructure that has gone in. Uh, it's excellent for cross-compiling. Um, <clears throat> and GCC releases themselves from the FSF, the GNU tool chain community, are supported for two years. So it provides a lot of stability for people utilizing the tool chain. Uh, I mean, in addition to the further support of the distros themselves, but that one is able to install this tool chain from the public FSF's uh, GCC and bin util sources and ensure that this is going to be available and stable and maintained for an extended period of time um, for uses in, in the kernel and that uh, any you know, optimizations, any details that are, that are needed are going to be available and maintained by the community as a whole. Um, highlights that some people will be talking about at other topics in this conference is you know, recent improvements of the, the uh, Intel uh, CET infrastructure, ARM with their new SVE architecture going in, the RISC-V port was just, uh, back end was just added in OpenRISC, uh, OpenMP5 was just added last week as the, uh, that uh, uh, standard was, was finally approved. Uh, there is ongoing support for the C++2X. Um, lots of optimization improvements from link time optimization, register allocator, uh, the inline uh, uh, assembler clarifications and the definitions of that, uh, work on register pressure, work on loop optimizations for the application support. So it's a very actively maintained uh, you know, infrastructure that's also responding to all the CVEs, all the security concerns, and this is a you know, very reliable, robust, and highly performing system that people are using now in production in a lot of places and a lot of uh, businesses, I mean, in addition to, uh, you, know, you know, many different major websites that one would go to are all, uh, you know, banks, I mean, lots of infrastructure that depends, you know, financial systems, insurance systems, uh, financial markets that depend upon this infrastructure that all of you, all of the people in the audience working on Linux and all the people working on the tool chain are providing uh, for the economy of the world. Uh, talking about glibc, I um, mean, again, uh, glibc Linux 3.2 is now the minimum requirement for glibc. There's again been you know great work by Intel on the CET infrastructure there, which which HJ and others will be talking about later. New infrastructure for uh, the quad precision floating point of uh, PowerPC that's been added. Uh, support for RISC-V recently went in. Uh, a lot of great work on optimizations of of malloc. Uh, to make that more, you know, competitive with, with TC Malloc, again, you know, work in, and uh, a lot of collaboration with other uh, C libraries out there, Unicode support, thread support uh, for C11 threads, um, reallocation support, uh, static um, position independent code support. You know, this is a very actively, again, developed uh, infrastructure. There's a lot of, uh, you know, challenges to how this works with Linux, how it works with Linux kernels, Linux handlers, Linux system calls, but there's a lot of work that's going on both collaborating with the Linux community and collaborating with all the standards out there and uh, improving the performance of the infrastructure. Uh, a lot of work that's been done, especially by ARM and Linaro on the math libraries, making those much faster for the generic code, uh, optimizing a lot of important math functions. 
um, support now from uh, uh, code sorcery, mentor graphics, and the uh, floating point conformance to new uh, floating point standards. A lot of work by uh, on string and memory optimizations, copying, mem copy, like in, in ARM, in Intel, and in PowerPC. So there's a lot of work on, on architectures, and it's very open for people who want to contribute, but these, uh, you know, server high-performing architectures are, are investing a lot of effort. The developers and the uh, chip vendors are investing a lot of effort to make glibc better on all the major platforms. And as I mean, some people are probably aware, a lot of discussions recently about glibc and Linux headers, and we're you know, open to having more conversations about that, how to make this uh, interdependence work more smoothly, and how we can ensure that, that GCC, glibc, bin utils, all of this continues to be a really great infrastructure on which Linux. <laughs> mm. <laughs> now back to our regularly scheduled programming. Um, <laughs> so, GDB, there's been a lot of work uh, there. Again, it's over 50 architectures that are supported uh, with, uh, on GDB. Um, and again, GDB provides you know, great opportunity for Linux on embedded systems with remote debugging. There's, it now uses a C++ 11 as the basis for the implementation of GDB. Uh, a lot of great work on C++ on, on floating point emulation. Uh, so it really provides a very good, robust effort. Um, the new work from a, an external developer providing a great user interface for GDB in, in Python. There's now Rust language support in GDB. There's RISC-V support. So again, it's a very actively developed, improving, and, and, and you know, important infrastructure for debugging of user applications and the kernel as well. Uh, bin utils, a lot more effort on, again, just you know, portability, on conformance, on you know, compatibility between Gold and GNU LD. It's a very robust environment. I mean, security. Again, working in the Intel CET support, uh, the, the other security work for uh, you know, spectre mitigation uh, in the tool chain. And um, so, you know, future issues. Again, you know, in GCC, uh, you know, G Rust is supported in GDB. Patches are welcome. If anybody wants to work on that, we'd very much like to have Rust support in the GNU tool chain and in the uh, GNU compiler. Uh, uh, Oh, sorry, that was uh, Swift. Uh, it's supposed to be, uh, I guess it did a, a somebody did a automatic uh, spelling correction on that. <laughs> a WebAssembly back, you know, back end would be wonderful. Um, you know, questions in, in GCC, as I was discussing with some people here, there's a question of what exactly is the language, and people were discussing again with, you know, compatibility with Clang for building the kernel. There is GNU C with extensions that are formally defined in the GNU uh, in GCC to the language. There's ISO C or ANSI C. Uh, there's Linux kernel C, which again has been providing uh, interesting challenges to Clang and, and provides interesting challenges to uh, GCC as well. And there is the uh, uh, or do what I mean C, which is what people are writing, uh, a language that has a syntax of C and semantics that are similar to, but not exactly the same as ISOC, and how to, to provide that balance between what people's expectations of the behavior versus what the standard and how much uh, GCC and, uh, and Clang should be conforming to standards versus, uh, especially with undefined behavior, uh, it's, it's an open challenge. There's work on uh, the year 2038 in uh, glibc, uh, you know, questions about uh, future using link time optimization in GCC or uh, LLVM for compiling the kernel, uh, similar for, for unikernels. Uh, live patching is an, an open question area that uh, how to, in recent patches to make that uh, infrastructure better for the kernel uh, in the compiler. Uh, Linux system call wrappers, again, has been a lot of discussions about exactly how fast, how soon that should be defined, which ones should go in, the, the best way to provide that, and, and there's, we need a lot more discussion between the Linux kernel community and the GCC and glibc communities about how to ensure that this, uh, this, this, this inf infrastructure gets developed in a way that, that everybody uh, can, can be comfortable with, if not completely happy. Uh, and, uh, you know, and, and another issue with 
processors and releases, that uh, new infrastructure goes into a processor, how soon does that get is that available in the compiler for supporting a kernel, how soon is that available in the C library, again, uh, with the, the long-term support, and yet the processors have many, many different uh, optimizations and trade-offs in their pipelines, how to provide the best uh, stability to developers and to users while also providing the, the most performance system that is available with the latest improvements and chips. So that's the you know, questions that we have uh, for issues. And again, uh, you know, free software is open to everyone. The, the, the GNU tool chain you know, has all architectures and ISAs are welcome and, and a huge number, over 50 are supported. Programming languages, welcome to all. ABIs, um, operating system, and again, all developers, the, the GNU tool chain provides a very uh, you know, welcoming environment and doesn't prioritize any uh, particular group, any particular set of developers, any particular processor vendors, or any particular operating system vendors. It's an open environment that we welcome uh, everybody to contribute to and look for discussion and, and how to improve this collaboration uh, given the you know, great amount of interdependency that exists between the Linux community uh, and the Linux kernel developers and the, uh, the tool chain for providing this environment that the, the rest of the world uh, knows about but doesn't necessarily know all the, uh, the bits and pieces and plumbing. So that's it. Thanks very much. Any um, question? Okay, great. So, um, want to move on to the uh, the next speaker so we don't uh, fall behind on. Okay. So, no question. So we can move to the next speaker. Thank you, David. Yeah. Yeah. I'm gonna switch. This is the set, right? The C. Yes, yeah, C. Yeah. Okay, here, this is a presentation about the uh, new security feature in upcoming Intel processors. Uh, it's called Control Flow Enhancement Technology. So, CET has two components. And one is called Shadow Stack, the other one is called IBT stands for indirect branch tracking. And I will describe those two features in upcoming slide. So here is control flow. Uh, it's in the uh, used by CET. And uh, one is a return instruction. And uh, the other one is an indirect call or jump either through memory or through register. For shadow stack, in the XC6 put return address on the stack together with other information of the, of the function, local variable, things like that. And the shadow stack is we, in the hardware, maintain a separate stack. 
The only thing in the shadow stack is the return address. So when you do a function return, the hardware will check to see if the return address on shadow stack matches the return address on the normal stack. If you do not, if they do, do not match, you got a uh, fault. That will pro present a challenge for the uh, exception handling, set jump, long jump, also the U context. And uh, basically, you have to make sure when you adjust your call stack, you have to adjust your shadow stack by the same amount. And uh, this is basically how we are supporting the exception handling. And also in the set jump, long jump, we have to save and restore the uh, sh the uh, shadow stack pointer. In the U context, that is we are using the uh, restore token as part of the CET feature to, to switch shadow stack between different U contexts. Let's talk about indirect branch tracking. CET with the indirect branch tracking requires all the indirect branch targets. They must start with the end branch instruction. And that instruction is the no op on the legacy processors. And also, we can have a no, pre, no track prefix to disable IBT. And another way we can enable legacy libraries, we, ha we can have a legacy bitmap to disable IBT per pa on page between different uh, uh, range, basically, the page. Uh, the one bit represent uh, one page in the legacy bitmap. So we have CET in the new processors. We have existing <coughs> softwares. Either they can be Dotto file in an archive, or they can be shared libraries. So we have to make sure the one requirement is the CET software, it has to be backward compatible and forward compatible. By that it means if you have an existing Dotto file, if you have existing uh, shared libraries, you can still use them with other components which are CET enabled. Of course, you won't get protection, but the resulting executables or shared library will still run correctly, even on today's hardware, today's processors and CET enabled processors. So the way we do this, we are saying if a, com if a file can be a Dotto file or shared library, if they are CET enabled, they have to be marked. So we introduce a new section in the out file. It's a no section. They are optional. It will, if it is CET enabled, we have two bits, one for IBT, the other one for shadow stack. They will be marked. So the, the linker, as well as the loader, will make sure a file is CET enabled only if all the components are CET enabled. So that's how we support mix and, mix and match of different CET enabled uh, Dotto files, shared libraries with other CET legacy inputs. And also the uh, CET enabled programs 
are binary compatible with legacy processors. We, are, we have a kernel support and the loader support to check to see if you are running on the CET capable so processors as well if the binary we are loading is CET enabled or not. And uh, yeah, so that's basically, it's all the requirement we are putting together to support the uh, compatibility between the older processor and new one and as well as old and new binaries. So this is how, this is how we enable CET in GCC. Uh, we place the end branch instruction in every potential indirect branch targets like uh, global functions and or the static functions which are, whose address are taken and uh, we generate a marker the node section say they are CET enabled. And also we provide a header file. You can include in your assembly code when you compile your assembly code with GCC when you say uh, F, we will enable CET with automatic place the marker in your assembly output. Runtime. So that's, that runtime covers all the runtimes. Can be GDPC, libgcc, libftdc, plus any uh, runtime libraries. Same thing. If you have a function can be reached through the uh, function pointer, it has to start with end branch. And also, when you own one shadow stack, and make sure you also unwind the, uh, uh, you own the, the, the cost that also unwind one the shadow stack. And set jump, long jump, we already talked about this. And also the uh, U context, we use restore token to switch between different uh, shadow stacks. So what takes to enable CET in the application? If you are writing C and C++ code, there are no assembly code, only thing you need is just compile with compiler option. That's the uh, dash F CET protection, a uh, CF protection, you will get CET protection automatically. However, if you have assembly code, if just a normal assembly code, the only thing you need is N branch on potential indirect branch targets. But if you are managing stacks yourself, then you need to also unwind the shadow stack when you change the stack. Yeah, of course, you have to mark everything the CET enabled. Otherwise, the uh, combined the output will not be CET enabled. So this is the current status. The uh, CET spec is available by doing Google search. And I'm in the uh, process to put the CET spec in the uh, upcoming future ISA extensions uh, that will be available in the uh, part of the uh, future ISA. So CET has been enabled in GCC 8 and the BUTL 2.31 and GDPC 2.28. And we also have uh, some RVM and RD changes we are working on to enable them in, in the CLAN as well as RD. Uh, the one thing about CET is because it is backward compatible and forward compatible, you can enable CET in your OS piece by piece. You don't have to enable CET in one shot. Of course, you have to start with the GCC and the GDPC, and then you can go from there. 
And once you compile everything with a dash FCF protection, your whole OS will be CET enabled. <coughs> and we have Linux kernel patch. We are trying to upstream and hopefully soon we are working on that. And uh, that's <coughs> about it, about CET. Any questions? Uh, I have one question. Which is the plan for this CIT extension regarding new processors? Will it be a baseline extension or will it be something just for um, a small set of, of uh, chips? That particular feature will be available in Tiger Lake. And uh, I have, I, I do not know when it will be uh, available. Uh, my understanding, this is a security feature. We take security very seriously. I believe starting from Tiger Lake, you will see CET in, in uh, or in Intel processor. So the idea is to have this enable on all distribution in the future, so you That is our hope. Right. We will, right now, we are working with Red Hat on that, and uh, started with Fedora 28, and if you are downloading Fedora 29 today, the GCC and GDPC are CT enabled, and if you, they are all properly marked, uh, they are, I didn't count how many packages have been CT enabled, but quite a lot. As I said, you do not need to enable CT in one shot. You can enable piece by piece. And you, when you do a recompile, make sure you compile with the CF protection, then, after you recompile everything, your whole OS is CET enabled. And the thing is, uh, we measure the uh, code size impact is minimal, and because the uh, shadow stack, the compiler does not do anything special about shadow stack, mostly. And uh, for the IBT, you only need to put a four byte no up at the beginning of a function global function. So the overall code size increase for most applications less than one percent. In some extreme case, you have many, many small functions, you can get up to two percent uh, code size increase. Uh, for in terms of the performance, uh, we don't have a CET processor yet, so we do not have CET performance on CET processors, but CET enabled the application on legacy processors. Most of the performance difference are just within noise range, and, uh, but certain benchmark you may, you may see up to 2% slowdown. I wanted to ask, when you have a CET enabled application, <coughs> so it's been built, linked, does the operating system need to do something special to start it in CET mode or does that happen automatically? Okay. Uh, of course, the OS has to enable CET. If your OS is not CET enabled, CET will not be enabled. Uh, to enable, enable CET, you need minimal enable, I mean minimal effort. So you need to do three things. You need to, you need to uh, enable GCC. When you configure GCC, you have to do a dash that enable CET. That will enable CET in GCC runtime. When you build GDPC, you have to do a uh, config GDPC with dash dash enable CET you will enable CT in your GDPC. Once you do that, once, if you have a C, once the kernel changes, 
upstream is done, you will get automatic protection. It's everything automatic. Yeah. You do not need to do anything. Yeah. So the Fedora 28 with CET enabled, does that include the kernel changes? Not yet. Okay. So it's just the user space has been compiled. Uh, so in, in order to, you can try, you can get the kernel from the yeah. link there. And uh, 20, 29 is, as I said, I mean, probably it's 40%, maybe higher, maybe lower. Yeah. I, I didn't yeah. check really. It means exactly how the percentage wise. No, that's fine. I was just interested in how it got started. So I, I now understand it needs the kernel changes and they're waiting to go upstream. Yeah. Thank you. Um, could you summarize what is the purpose of the end branch instruction? I mean, how is the processor using that information to mitigate what security problem exactly? Okay. Uh, let me, I have some backup slides, so I don't know if I can go through that. Uh, okay. So basically, this CT is trying to prevent the uh, uh, attack like this. You run through Stack Overflow. Stack Overflow and uh, you will see you have, we have Stack Overflow, the uh, return address got, over, got overridden, like in this case. And uh, also the x86 instruction can start from anywhere. <laughs> so then you got this normally, this is the move instruction, now you got something different. And the shadow stack will prevent when you return to something it's not supposed to. So that's, that's one. And also IBT will make sure when you do a jump, if, if you change somehow your pointer address, the value got changed, may point to some wild place. The uh, end branch, without end branch, that particular place will be invalid target. So then when the end branch instruction gets executed for the first time from an indirect branch, somehow the processor can record it? It records that fact? No, and, uh, my understanding is indirect branch target has to start with end branch. If the first instruction is not end branch, you got a fault. Uh, okay, yeah, simple enough. Yeah. Yeah. So I think we are running out. Yeah. Yeah, so we have next slide. Yeah, so I can I put it over there. Yeah, we'll just leave it on the table. So, <coughs> so this talk is about the uh, CPU runtime. And David already mentioned briefly about long lead time between the uh, support we put into open source project, can be GCC or GDPC, and the time it reaches the end user. It can be several years. So that's the uh, issue we are trying to address with this uh, proposal. And uh, today, Intel, IBM, ARM, and the different vendors, they, we put a lot of efforts to optimize GDPC runtime, especially the stream memory function for today's processor. Uh, in case of uh, Intel, we put in some 
optimization with AVX, AVX512 in terms of master FMA. FMA. They all sounds great. You got a speed up and 2x, 4x, whatever they are. Sound wonderful. And however, it takes years to get to the end user. And uh, in the cloud, in the enterprise environment, the people are still using enterprise Linux Red Hat like seven. It, they are using GDPC 2017 that released five years ago. And uh, now even we have today a wonderful optimization, nobody really is using them. And same thing will happen over and over again every time we put optimization in today, it will take five years to get to the end, to the end user. So I, this is a proposal to, to address this particular issue. So CPU runtime library. And it is just a subset of GDPC. Uh, right now, it's only optimized for x86-64. Uh, I call that CPU RT-C, potentially can be a dash M for math library. Uh, it is only contain memory stream functions, nothing else. Uh, it's binary compatible with any uh, x86-64 share libraries, OSs. But compatible with CentOS 7, RHEL 4, even RHEL 3, if still people are still using them. And uh, so if anyone can use that, it's better compatible just build once as part of the GDPC build. The same binary can be placed anywhere. It's just there are no dependency whatsoever. It's totally self-contained. Uh, to use that, you can use LD preload. You, and they, whatever provided in the uh, libcpurt will override the system one. And of course, you can also link them, uh, link it directly in your application. You will, of course, get the uh, latest uh, optimization. We run some tests. So um, this is, is a hard, it's a dual socket, Haswell processor. This is the, we pick the CentOS, old one, and we're in GCC uh, 8. And the, uh, this is, we use the, uh, the thing is, this library only contain memory functions. So we pick the uh, my SQL test data. Uh, because there's this database, there are many string, con copy, compare, what are memory functions. So this is uh, uh, basically the uh, improvement we have seen. And uh, yeah, it's, uh, it's, it's visible. And the other data, so, they are, and I think, yeah, this, yes. So, this library is very, uh, not very intrusive, and uh, it's compatible. Everybody can use, and we are using existing Test. We are not writing anything from scratch. We only putting some infrastructure in the GDPC uh, tree. We take existing test free, uh, framework. We take existing well tested library the functions. Just make them available to everyone, and uh, it. Uh, yeah. So this. They are, we can deliver the best performance to anyone who want them. They do not have to wait five years 
to get the GDP 20 2.28 on their today's Skylake server. Five years from now, they are, running, they are probably running different processors. Uh, yeah, that's the basically uh, what uh, was uh, what we found. Anything else? Uh, that's the standard Intel thing. Yes. So, uh, okay. So the first question would be uh, regarding uh, iFunks. So do you, when you when you're making this package, so I have I have like three four different questions. So uh, when you're making the package, are you actually building in the iFunk resolver and everything else with it, or just preload? Okay. iFunk. Everything is in there self-contained. Okay. iFunk. Yes. Right. iPhone is, is used. So the second question is, uh, why not just have those things backported to RHEL 6, RHEL 7, whatever. RHEL 7, I guess. <laughs> have you tried? Uh, there's, there's no ABI break there, so it should uh, be possible. It's not going to happen. They, they, they don't no, I'm not. Uh, so I'm not going to speak for Carlos. I'm just, I'm just saying, <laughs> no, I, with, with respect it's, to ABI, uh, it's it, 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 if, if you look at the changes we put in for, for I function, for everything, I don't even want to ask to backport. Okay. <laughs> because well, no, because I mean, there, 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 I mean, well, I mean, there, 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 there's a technical issue and then there is the, the safety and robustness issue. Because clearly, it, you know, it, it's technically feasible to backport this to it. But especially in the enterprise, I mean, even, even if Red Hat were willing to do it, the question is then that, that Intel and IBM and ARM all want this out to enterprise class customers, and those customers are not going to accept this type of invasive, you know, we've tested, we've verified the code, we've gone through whatever with, you know, the banking, you know, regulators and everybody else. Oh, we're just gonna throw in some new pieces of code. I don't think so. so okay, as now speaking as a past maintainer uh, for RHEL, uh, it's not that we haven't done this in the yeah. past, right? Uh, maybe RHEL 7 is far too ahead because of which you're probably not going to yes. do that. Which leads me to the third question. Yes. How do you package this and how do you deliver this to customers? Yes, good question. And. Uh, Originally, uh, okay, it, as I said, it's part of, right now, it's part of GDPC as a patch, okay, it's, it's a branch. It's sitting on a branch, part of, the, the part of GDPC. The, right now, the only way you can build it is you build it as a separate library when you build GDPC. So, how do we package it? So, and we, about six months, maybe more ago, I tried to uh, submit my <coughs> patch, and uh, I don't think that there is agreement if we, w if we want that in GDPC or not. <laughs> but I do believe, at least for the Intel customers, because I almost get an email, either external or internal email asking, why the mem copy mem says so slow on Skylake server, you know, things like that, performance wise. Uh, so there clearly there's customer uh, interest. So the one way to, uh, that because this is binary compatible with every single available x86 OSs, we were, we was thinking we just Build binary. Of course, every open source is on GitHub. It's not a question. If you do not, if you are OS, you are compiler, you are linker, you are too old to build that thing yourself, we make the pre built binary available. Say on GitHub. You just download. Right. So, uh, which, which brings me to the previous point where. Uh, you're not actually providing something that is supportable in the long, ter long term. It's something that you're providing as a stopgap until, say, 
I don't know, rel, next, whatever is available, mm, right? Yeah. So, which is, which is the reason why I would uh, have like a mild objection to having something like that in the glibc sources, because it's, it's kind of like a stopgap for now, and we, we probably won't need it ahead. Well, I mean, that's that's the only reservation oh, I have okay. about this. Okay, maybe the current one is stock up for today, right. but the same thing will happen in five years. Yeah, exactly. So the question really is, can we? I mean, I think the, the logical next question is really, can we partition the string routines to, or some of these key routines to go into libcpurt that, and become something like libpthread that falls yes. out from libc or Libm, yeah. For example, certainly, certainly. That is that that is that is where this should probably be going. <laughs> I think. But it's it's more controversial, I would say. <laughs> no. So I mean, a, a, a better a better option, in my opinion, would be to kind of reduce the footprint of each of those routines. Like, so all of these iFunk routines are essentially like. So there's there's one routine that you want to backport for Skylake. And the impact for that routine is basically going to be just Skylake processes. So it's it's not going to have as wide an impact as it, everyone fears it to be, right? So so which is the reason why I, my my first question was that it's an iFunk uh, alternative. So okay, so there are there are two aspects to this. There's there's the x86 iFunk, and then there's ARM iFunk. Right, so for x86, a lot of the iFunk facility is there. It, as in, what what you'll probably need to do is backport the routine, and you're done with it. Uh, ARM is a lot more complex, which is the reason why I'm not even getting ARM into the picture because ARM you'll have to get all of the MIDR stuff in, you'll have to get all of the tunable stuff in, so and that's then today. yeah, exactly, that's, so today. that's today. Right. right? So the question but is, in future, can we do something in the future where I mean the framework's in there today. For ARM. Right. So if you, the, the design question here is, do we want to structure the string routines inside glibc so that they are a separate libcpurt, and then, you know, five years from now, it's no longer an issue. It will be a problem for the next new architecture, probably, because they may have issues with backporting their iFunk stuff. So it's not just that. So you, you also yeah, yeah. have the issue of uh, resolving. Yeah, I mean, yeah. <laughs> okay, so maybe you, we are monopolizing this, and maybe we should let other people other, ask questions I, on this. I just want to clarify one thing. Okay, and probably what you mentioned is um, kind of um, specific issue. For x86, it's not a real big issue in terms of iPhone implementation, and. Uh, before glibc 2.28, we laid groundwork to make that possible. That's why I'm saying backporting may not be easy. May, right, it's that's, not. That's what I so we laid yeah. groundwork. In such a way, uh, what, we, what really happened in the CPURT is we have an init function. It, call, it collect all the CPU data <laughs> and uh, it store somewhere. And uh, we use that piece of information to implement iPhone. It's straightforward, very, I won't say simple, but it's very straightforward. The overhead is minimal. And of course, you pay some code size increase. That's, that's a given. Other than that, I, on x 6 I do not see a maintenance issue. As I said, we do not write any stream memory functions. We just take whatever is in GDPC we're putting Today, make it available to our customers, not five years from now. But uh, tunables have been mentioned, right, for example. And then you say that the, the AFUNC functionality that you rely on in, the, in this library is self-contained in the Perry library, right? But for, like, what, what with uh, architectures were, because for example, in RHEL, we don't have tunable support in glibc one seventeen to seventeen, for example. So, I mean, what other than the string routines that you already have in your library? What else do you plan to move there or to make it available? 
the other functions? Yeah. Yeah, so because what, nothing, for example, relying on, on tunables will work. Uh, this particular thing... In all versions of glibc, depending I, on, for example, on tunables. I, do, I believe, I didn't mention that, I believe they are tuned, GD tunable is also supported, I think. I would double check. Inside this? Yeah, I think so, yeah. Inside? Yeah, that's the way we implement. Okay, so you are providing sort of a complete uh, so compatibility library then. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we are, it's kind of complete. It's so then no. we will stop back backporting and just preload your library. Yes, yes. you can do that. Yes. That's the whole idea. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so that means that you do the work instead of us. <laughs> we make that available as a CPU RT. Send that to your customers. Yeah. The problem is deciding what libcpurt should really look like. And yes. That's the fundamental question here. It's, uh, sorry, the, the fun, that's the fun, I keep going back to that like a broken record, but that's really the fundamental question here. Because whatever we say about tunables and whatnot today, it's today's problem. Tomorrow we may have something else. So how do we keep this going? It is the problem of new features going back or wanting yeah, yeah. a time machine basically. Yeah. Well, this is too good to be true, <laughs> if it works. Give it a try. No, I will send out links to where you can get things. <laughs> and regarding to, to that point about RHEL, um, we have been facing this with even Carlos about some of the features that are already implemented in GLIBC. They're not being used very often, like in this example. It has been proposed to the patch since when? Since two, what, two months ago, like a month ago? More than two months, I think. More than two months ago. So. It's going to be, at some point, maybe merged into GLPC Master, maybe. <laughs> <laughs> and the point is, this, this was a panel about to do the call out to the distribution to actually use these kind of features that has been enabled, not only in GLPC, but we'll see also on compiler section and so on to provide that to customers. Yeah, so there are two aspects. First, I want to address, so, so I named the, the, fun, the library called CPURT-C. That imply potentially can be dash M. Like ARM has contributed a lot of new uh, optimization for MAT libraries. Mm -hmm. Potentially can be a, if someone wants. Right. So, and again, why we've got to decide what this looks like. That's <laughs> that's the question. We can't have tactical backports into this. We've got to give a structure to this. Are we saying that it's going to just replace all of? You know, you just backport anything you want into that. It, we have to be careful about this. No, we need no, rules okay. around this. The, the um, one particular feature, there's no backport at all. In, my, in this proposal, there are no backport. No, but can we take Yeah, yeah. I think we should take audience questions, yes. questions <laughs> Last question. Yeah. Any last question for this? Okay, good. Great. Thank yep. you. Thank you, Shalou.
that scene? This one scene? Working now? It's okay? It's working? Okay. So, hello, my name is Ademir Valdanella. I work for Linaro Tool Chain Drug. Okay. Speak louder. Speak louder? Is it working now? It's better? Okay. So, my presentation now is to, it's more a request for comments how we're going to improve the kernel and GDC relationship to solve some long-standing issues uh, that come up on the mail list recently and often and often. Uh, how we're going to implement features that GDBC lacks that kernel supports for a long time, for instance, the term IO2. Uh, how we organize and synchronize the kernel headers and kernel features with GDBC uh, and how we solve these communication problems that uh, it seems to have between uh, the kernel developers and GNU to chain developers that sometimes we see that th they are working on separately and not communicate correctly. And uh, <coughs> my presentation is that we have, I, I'm going to show various issues that we have and various discussions and I would like some kernel input because uh, we need that input, or otherwise we're gonna talk with each other. And uh, let's start with the first one, uh, which is syscall droppers. It came, it came recently on a GDBC uh, mail list discussion. <coughs> and how are we gonna provide the latest Linux syscall on GDBC? So the, the idea is, should we provide a theme wrapper with any glibc or any libc interaction should be uh, what about the all the syscalls uh, posix and the standard requirements li like for r no p thread cancellation uh, kernel optional flags that we set to avoid old abi for instance on the sysvipc uh, how are we going to handle syscall fallback implementation for instance by using ESO, uh, by providing this thing wrapper, how it can handle this uh, of, of key uh, call incubation differences, which is for now, now we're gonna have the time and time T. So the question I ask you uh, from the kernel point of view, should we provide this thing wrapper? Is it something that uh, GLBC should, should provide or something that kernel should provide? So I have initiated this particular discussion at least twice, I believe. Um, I'm H. Peter Anman. Um, I believe that the most sensible thing to do is for <coughs> these, is for the things that don't have libc dependencies, I believe that this should be in the kernel tree. Uh, and the reason for that is that a lot of these things don't, aren't dependent on any particular libc. And the other reason is that just the tie, tying them together, it inevitably causes delay. And not only does it cause delay, but it causes uh, distributions to be a lot more nervous about release uh, about um, releasing them so I think we are I think we're able to do a much better job at keeping a lib kernel clo clo more more closely aligned with the kernel in practice than it would be even possible to do in glibc but do you mean by providing a library itself or a VDSO like interface that someone suggested on the mail list? Um, I mean a library. Um, VDSO, VDSO entries are highly useful. 
uh, when they you know when they're necessary. Um, whether or not you want to do VDSO <coughs> specifically for this or for things that aren't necessarily um, going to be used, that's another that's another matter uh, entirely. Um, I need to think about that. Okay. Do. Hey. Thank you. Um, so I think it could even just be a, a single header file with inline functions. And we can probably come up with a way to generate those inline functions soon. Um, I'm working with one of my colleagues on a way to generate the unistd.h header files from an architecture independent description file that we already have on x86 and some other architectures and we want to have it on all the architectures, we'll soon have that, and at that point, it should become a lot easier to, to generate something from the descriptions we already have in the kernel. And one of those outputs could be a library or a header file. And the header file would be kind of strange, because it, if we put it in the kernel headers, it would still have a dependency on the C library for calling the syscall function, because every architecture has okay. a different way of passing the arguments back into the kernel. But uh, we could have that as, the exp as one of the exported kernel headers, just a set of functions uh, where each function do goes back to yeah. syscall to implement one of the yeah. kernel syscalls that we have. So I already have um, that mechanism uh, built uh, from, from Caleb C. Mm -hmm. And that's part of why I believe that it would be better to do it as a um, as an actual library because it gets kind of, um, it, it does get kind of excessive to do that sort of stuff in a VDSO. It would grow the VDSO c considerably. I, I wouldn't do it in a VDSO. I was just no, thinking in the no, header but file. Thi yeah. This stuff can be done in a library in a way that is not dependent on calling sysc syscall3, which by the way is inherently broken on certain architectures. We, we could also put the syscall3 into a VDSO, like uh, a, we an could, equivalent of that. No, oh. uh, here it's not that simple. Uh, th th there's uh, another. Sys syscall3 on some architectures can only be implemented by having a per system call stub. Oh. So. My next question is, do we have syscalls now that do, GDBC does not, do not provide that are actually useful? And uh, what prevent us to provide them? It's an open question. <laughs> the, the Mount API, maybe? That would be the first thing that comes to mind. We just added. OK. So the reason why syscall3 is, uh, is fundamentally broken is that, well, first of all, it is, it is ABI dependent, and different architectures will have different ABIs. The second problem is that on architectures that do uh, alignment of, um, of uh, argument that are 64 bits on 32 bits uh, architectures, the insertion of the syscall number uh, in syscall3 will de-align yeah. the rest of them. So you have the wrong alignment and you now will have the ABI insert paddings in the wrong places. Uh, you could sort of fix that by making the, ar the, the syscall argument excessively large. Uh, that has its own issues, obviously. Yeah. Okay, so it aligns with uh, the current discussion is, do we need formal description for the syscalls? Just that uh, an argument for using the VDSO, it makes it really easy to check at runtime what that exact kernel supports, right? Like, <laughs> is this syscall available now becomes a DL sim? Okay, so 
Do we need a formal description for the syscalls? Is it something that the kernel would provide? Uh, because from the DDC standpoint, if we have this kind of information, it might simplify our new inclusions and our internal machinery to discover what the syscall is provided by the, the uh, kernel headers. Yeah, we are already working on that. Um, it's a, um, we, uh, if you need additional information, it would be good to uh, work with you to make sure that that information actually is there. Okay, thank you. So, uh, so the next thing which uh, is, was also discussed on the mail list is, it, be, it will be good to have consistent kernel support for all the arch independent syscalls. For instance, when uh, the kernel defines a new syscall, it should be included on all the architectures at the same time. Uh, this issue is still bite us on the recent releases. We just found out, for instance, that the Spark has some issue with the uh, sub not optimized syscalls right up. And uh, I think Arn has, uh, has discussed this uh, on that, on the mail list about what kind of work you're doing to Yeah, so I, I haven't really gotten a lot of feedback about this, but the, the, the idea that I brought up is that when we add the new 20 system calls for 2038, at the same time we also make sure that all the architectures support a common subset of system calls that they currently don't. Uh, basically everything that's in the ASM generic file would also be available on every single architecture. They might have additional ones that are duplicates of those and additional ones that are architecture specific and make no sense everywhere. Right. Uh, um, but what about the, the other syscalls? Will, will be something that the kernel would pursue to, so to the, help us? The, my ideal idea for, the, for any future system calls would be that we add at least the system call numbers at the same time for every one but probably that also implies we, add, we, we hook them up at the same time. Right. Um, there's an interesting question about whether we keep doing what we've done forever, which is to define an architecture independent number for each system call, or we decide at this point to take, make, make a break in the, in, in the way we handle it and make all the future numbers the same across architectures, which uh, would not be a big issue, I think. It could just, when you already synchronize everything, we have around 300 system calls on all of them. So if we just pick whichever architecture has the most and assign numbers from there on, uh, that would be very easy. We, we still probably have two different ones. We have the ASM generic, which has 100 fewer system calls than the, the ones that came before it. Right. But we, we still have only two different numbers that are possible. The, the numbers itself is, is not a problem for us. The problem is to have to handle different architectures that has different syscalls wide up in different versions. Yeah. Uh, I don't think you can use the same syscall number uh, for some arch architectures it won't work. For example, for MIPS, that have like, you know what you have for MIPS. No, uh, but for MIPS it would, would have to be the, the offset from the starting number. Like okay. we have the 3,000 or 4,000 uh, as the yeah. number of the first system call for a given ABI and then instead of using system call number 304, we use 4,304. But we would make it but consistent and Yeah, but this way you would impose a limitation because of this offset gap, you would impose a limitation on the highest syscall number. Uh, <laughs> oh, yes. OK. OK, next topic, kernel and GLBC header coordination. Uh, this is a long stand issue where sometimes it broke, sometimes it works. We do not have. Uh, direct way to actually test it. Yeah. It depends of someone to bring this up, either to glibc or to the kernel developers that something has broken. So my question is, how can I improve that? Um, 
we have some scripts on GDBC which actually install a kernel, like a kernel header, and recompile all the tool chain. And uh, one option would be to hook up uh, some permutation to actually test if the kernel headers is working. But uh, I'm open to suggestions because currently we do not have any mechanism to actually test it. I think specifically if we could have something in kernel CI that actually on, on every commit kind of tries to rebuild Chilipsy master or something like that. We have to make headers check target, which is probably being called in kernel CI. Uh, I would put it in there so that anybody who runs make headers check gets the same output. And right now we do a couple of checks, but not a lot. Uh, we could add additional checks in there that we think are useful for this. Yeah. And uh, another question would be, which kind of permutations we're gonna support? We're gonna support to include all the headers in all the manners, <coughs> or do we need us just a subset of the kernel headers that uh, is actually useful? I would say every kernel header should be includable by itself as the first step. Right. So if there's any kernel header, you include it, you get a compile error, that is a bug in the kernel that we should fix. Um, and we should have at least one way to combine each kernel header with any glibc header. And if they define the same structure, we should find a way to, uh, to make them coexist. I'm not sure if we can get to the way that we can make it work in all combinations, um, but that would be the minimum, I think. Uh, some, uh, as, a, as a person who submit fixes for uh, after each release uh, to fix uh, UIP headers uh, that uh, stop self-compiling, uh, what I can say, uh, some, some maintainers accept these patches, but some just, for some headers that are no maintainers at all, they are completely ignored. I mean, the patch is submitted for them. And some are like, considered too old to be fixed. Or, so I had all kinds of responses. And for some subsystems, they don't like the idea of the self-compiled self header because it, like, it uses, it's, it's used not just uh, for the kernel, but for user space. I don't remember exactly. I just stop, uh, stop patching these uh, headers. So unless you integrate this make check headers or whatever uh, into the process, uh, people like me would have to like patch the headers for each release, which is not good. <laughs> yeah, I think we have to we have to find a way to get the the baseline done. So basically, when we if we ever get to the point where it's less than ten patches missing, um, we should have those ten patches and the script changes to make it work, and then we can win, yeah. bypass the maintainers getting the, getting that done. Yeah. To to um, to make it clear, this is integrated in the process. It's just not complete yet. Okay. Uh, this next one is uh, something that we think might be useful, which is have point of context to discuss ABI issues or new syscalls, how to handle it. Is it an, a good addition? Is it not? The question is, do we have this kind of uh, point of context for the kernel? I would do say Arndt and myself. Do you okay. agree, Arndt? Yeah. Okay. That works for me. Okay. Yeah. And Linux API, you can always put it on CC. There's people subscribe to it. Um, OK. That works I, have, I have yet to get an answer to anything I posted on Linux API, but it's good to CC. <laughs> 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 OK. Uh, the, the, the next ones are more well, um, I, I can, can you go back one page? Sure. Uh, so I actually have the reverse problem. I, for the 2038 work that I've been doing, um, I've had lots of patches that I've sent with CC to the glibc mailing list. Yeah. And I also see tr I, I have trouble getting replies on it because I, I have decisions to make. And I was, I'm always hoping that people have an opinion on, th on things. but. When I get no feedback, I don't even know if people do, just don't have an opinion or if they don't think it would be the right reply okay, uh, for them at the time. Uh, so it's, I'm, I'm lacking feedback from that perspective okay. too. 
Okay, man, from, from my point of view, what I see is GLIPC takes the kernel for granted, <coughs> and uh, what they can implement, we're going to set up on that. So that's a problem. We should interact more. We should mm -hmm. provide more feedback. But if you see that current uh, review, it's because since the, we, the kernel is already defined, now we can work with mm -hmm. instead of doing an interaction with you to, to, to get the better architecture. So yeah, uh, it's something that we can do for sure. And I think in general, we are kind of short on reviewers. Is that me or no? So oh, OK. So we, we're kind of short on reviewers in general. Uh, mm -hmm. The situation is kind of improving, but uh, yep. we would still appreciate help from people who have been involved in the uh, Linux new toolchain community to kind of uh, pitch in that as well. Even further. Okay. Okay. Moving on. So this is a old interface that Linux provide that uh, it, it was brought to our, our attention recently, uh, which is uh, Linux had support for this for 12 years, and we are still using the old interface. It, it works on PowerPC, right? Sorry? It, it, it works on PowerPC as far as I know. I think so, yeah. I think so. so. <laughs> that's not on any of the others. Yeah, but the, the problem is to, to try to make it happen we need to extend the term IO interface to uh, use an extension. So we are working on that. But this is an example where Linux provides something that GDPC lacks. And it's only become a problem when someone tries to actually use it. So uh, I'm going to ask you if you have that kind of iteration problem. For instance, oh, the Linux, I, I, I need to actually write down a library to, to use a Linux interface where it could be provided by DLibc, please come up to us and expose the problem. Uh, sometimes it, it requires a lot of cleanup for our part. We are doing that. Uh, for instance, or requires extensions to actually provide it, but uh, we are open to, to work on that problem. So it, it's a... Uh, uh, I don't know if it's going to be on the next release, but uh, it will be eventually. Uh, we hope so. So this is another long-standing issue, uh, which could be so which could be solved uh, on by user land. But uh, if the kernel could provide us with a better way, especially for x86 32 bits, it will be very nice performance-wise. So the problem wa was brought by Muscle Lead C some time ago because they, they create a way to, to actually check if the pit red cancellation has some side effect uh, regarding the syscall. And uh, the way they, they end up resolving this is using the old x86 32-bit int 8 instead of the VBSO. So do we the care? Yeah, the, the prob the, there's another question. Do we care for that? Do we care that? Do, do we care to actually uh, use the VDSO for x 32 bit. Why improve it? I mean, it's this is, it's a, I, I say obsolete architecture. I know, I know there's still people that care about it, but I don't know. I'm starting to say that we, they shouldn't, or okay. <laughs> they should move on. Yeah, another, another issue is Itanio. Itanio has the same issue. You need to use an old syscall. So actually, uh, I'll, 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 I'll talk to you about this offline. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So, this is a, a long stand issue with GLIPC, which is uh, we need to provide fork with a async signal safe. And the question is uh, can kernel help us? Because what we need is uh, we need to save and restore some state when the signal handler is executed. We can do this by wrapper all the signal handling, or we can get some kernel help to actually do this work for us in a non-race way. So for instance, uh, can the kernel get, give us an option to save and restore a memory operation, 
a memory, uh, a memory space when the signal handle is executed. Or is, is it something that uh, we, should, so, we should provide only by the, the user space? So wait, wait, what, what exactly do you need for this? Uh, one thing is uh, we need to save restore our no uh, when a signal handler is executed. <laughs> so one thing we can do that is by wrapping the signal handling in user space and handling all the waste condition that it might ha occur. Or we can ask for the candidate to do this job for us. I would almost say you okay. probably would uh, maybe send something out onto the mailing list or asking like this is an API I'd like to have. Okay, yeah. Uh, that'd probably be better instead of like say this is our problem space, this is our API we'd like to have would be, or should we just keep it in a uh, user space? I mean okay. that's something definitely send. Now uh, who do you CC for that? Uh, for single handling? I know Oleg does a lot of yeah. Nesterov. Um, yeah, if you look in. Yeah, anything that deals with signals and stuff like that, uh, Oleg Nesterov is the person you want to CC and send to. Okay. Uh, he's, he's a good guy to talk to. He's a smart and uh, okay, he's really uh, easy to work with. I think our time is done, right? Yeah. So I'm going to wrap up. Okay, thank you. Great talk. Well, you're really overselling it. <laughs> Great start. So, so. <laughs> All right, we're here to, to don't fall asleep, but we'll, we'll try to liven it up after we finish. Yeah, so I thought these were like discussions, not talks. So I basically didn't come with any slides. Uh, so I have two. I was told if I had more than three slides, I would be heckled loudly. Um, but I clearly read the wrong email. So I have two, sli two slides. Yeah, that's what I heard, right? I was going to have things thrown at me. So I have two slides. Um, so we're, we're here to talk about uh, the time T in the 32-bit RISC-V Linux uh, user space ABI. Uh, so I hope you guys all went to Arn's talk yesterday about generic good. Yeah, because um, <laughs> that's about the extent of what I know about 32-bit uh, time T ABIs, right? Um, so. Uh, Vague summary of what's going on in RISC-V land, right? So we have two base ISAs that are sort of Linux base ISAs. There's RV32I and RV64I. RV32I is 32 32 32-bit registers. RV64I is 32 64-bit registers, right? So uh, RV32I was submitted upstream along with RV64I into Linux, and they got accepted, but the RV32I port's super broken. Um, so for about a year, like, it didn't build, and as a result, we missed the glibc submission for 32-bit because kernel doesn't build, can't run any of the tests, all that sort of stuff. Um, so Zong has done a ton of work getting it back alive um, and has fixed it a couple of times. Um, and so now what we want to do is get into the next glibc release because 32-bit kernel is in decent shape and uh, the 32-bit glibc is in decent shape. And in glibc land, the code moves around a lot, and I find the build system very hard to navigate, so uh, I don't want to have to go do it again. Uh, you know, now that everything's working, let's kind of get it in sort of thing. Um, and I think people are pretty much aligned to getting the 32-bit glibc port in. The last big blocker was that we were failing a ton of floating point stuff, and that seems to have all been sorted out. Uh, so I think we're in pretty good shape there. The kernel builds, uh, you know, Zong's testing it and all that sort of stuff. Uh, so I think we'll be all lined up there. So now the big question left is basically, um, are we going to have a 32-bit time T or a 64-bit time T in the RV32i uh, you know, user ABI, so the kernel port and the glibc port? Um, so uh, this, this is the plan. So the plan is to go, my plan is to go with 64-bit. I think it's worth it because I think uh, we don't want to deal with 32-bit uh, ABI long term. If we do this, we're going to just have to switch over, have another ABI. We'll end up with this in one or two glibc releases. It'll get deprecated. No one will use it. There probably won't be any user spaces, and it'll be a big pain. Right? So uh, the hope here is that the glibc side of this is fairly straightforward, because uh, we don't need to have backwards compatibility with an existing 32-bit time t ABI. Uh, so we can figure out how to make that work. Um, and then the kernel side's a little trickier. If you went to Arn's talk yesterday, there will not be all the interfaces converted. 
Um, so I think we're just going to kind of deal with the fallout for a couple of release cycles. Uh, distros don't plan on doing RV32i super soon, so it's not like there's going to be a huge pile of users. Um, I don't think there's any hardware out there, so we should be okay. Uh, you know, most of the tests pass, and things like sound might not work uh, for a release. Um, so uh, that's effectively all I have to talk about. So the issue here is that uh, glibc is targeted to release February 1st. Um, and then the kernel merge window where we might be able to get the system calls done in time ends something like the day before that. Maybe that's a Monday and the merge window ends on a Sunday. So uh, <laughs> how much trouble am I going to get in? <laughs> The freeze would be December 31st. But I thought that was, so the plan is to get the port in earlier, like really soon now, because I think it's ready to go, right? Um, and then change the ABI if we can get it done at the last minute. <laughs> uh, I, I would recommend that you do that at least like by the end of December, or okay. I, I could probably give you like an extra week Okay. Yeah. on top of that. That's probably the best I could do. No, that's okay. Yeah, the issue is just um, lining everything up, if that makes sense, right? Because, so then the question becomes, can we run the test? <coughs> yeah. Uh, on the kernel side, as well, you cannot come on the merge window. Uh, Heads up. Closing. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> on the kernel side, also, you cannot count on the merge window just closing and getting your fix in just the one day before that or one yeah, day before no, that. Yeah, no, I understand but this yeah. is a huge, and terrible <laughs> way to do things. Yeah, And also, <laughs> the version numbers mismatch. You cannot count on distributions to always ship the combination you want. So you will have to think about uh, compatibility with uh, kernel that doesn't have the feature and glibc that has the feature and all, all those combinations. We, yeah. we know they will not be shipping older kernels. Because the older kernels don't build. OK. So they <laughs> that, can ship That them, removes one. <laughs> 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 yeah, so at least we're safe there, and that's why it seemed like it was kind of worth getting in, because um, then we could basically avoid having the old ABI, right? If we do 32-bit time T ABI in glibc, then we have to go throw it away probably at the next release, which seems kind of silly, um, if that makes sense. So I, I wonder if actually glibc is harder than the kernel. Okay. Because we do not have any glibc part for 32-bit that uses 64-bit time. Oh, well, we do have x32. Okay. Um, but still, it's going to be different from all the other parts, whereas the last few parts have all just been able to use the generic ABIs. Yeah, so the 64-bit the RISC-V port was super easy, right? Because right. there's no ABI stuff in there, basically. So if you if you have the first new architecture with a 32-bit time T, uh, with a 64-bit time T on a 32-bit architecture, and you don't have any of the other special cases that uh, X32 has, then that means you are different from the other ones. You need special code in glibc. Okay. Um, so I think that you will run into problems that need to be resolved after the basic kernel support is there. Okay, but I was thinking with the breadth of syscalls that are supported now in Linux land, we could at least get most of that work done sooner rather than later, if that makes sense. Well, we have not assigned any system call numbers to them. So we have okay. most of the system calls implemented, okay, but, there's nothing but not assigned a mm. number to them, so okay. you can't actually call them. Yeah, so this is going to be a lot of machinery then. Yeah, Adding the I system call numbers is trivial, so that's that's I, I can give you a patch for that. Yeah, the problem is um, just it's uh, <laughs> if no one's calling them, then yeah, <laughs> yeah, uh, okay. So now what I'm thinking is it smells like we're trying to go too fast, which is a it issue. it is certainly cutting. Yeah. Like it, right now, then the problem is, do we do a 32-bit time t ABI? If that makes sense. Yeah, so that's basically what we've done in the past few years in the kernel. Um, so at some point a few years ago, we made the decision about what we do about new 32-bit architectures being ported after we had the precedent of x32 where we went with a 64-bit time t. Yeah. It ha happened to not work out well at all because it caused problems left and right because it was the kernel was just not prepared for that. Um, so we the decision that was made in the kernel um, is that we continue to build all 
new architectures the same way, meaning we stay with the 32-bit time t, and then we fix them at the same time, all in the same way, by going to a 64-bit time t. Uh, because the, most important, the, the two most important architectures for 32-bit user space at the moment are x86 and ARM. Those have the most users. Yeah. Um, and we have to fix those anyway. So when we fix those, we can also fix RISC-V. Yeah, and the RISC-V 32-bit port is not something that people are clamoring for, if that makes right, sense. Exactly. That's why it was broken for so long. So it would be easy enough to do the same thing in glibc and make it uh, make the glibc port do the same thing on RISC V that we do on all the other 32-bit yeah. architectures yeah. and then fix it at the same time. Yeah, that's fine. I was just hoping to avoid right. uh, basically, you know, at this point, if we do the 32-bit time T ABI on RV32, we'll have whole ABI. There will probably no district that's built for. Mm -hmm. Probably isn't really ever used, if that kind of makes sense. Yes, Seems but kind the, of the advantage is that you don't have any special code. You don't no, have any, any yeah, if yeah. risk five. You just have the if we're using 32-bit time T or using 64-bit time T. Yeah, which is fine. It's, and it's, it's in, right? It's in glibc, which helps management stuff. We can test the kernel, right? It's just... Uh, if no one's really using it, um, it seems kind of funky. Yes, it, it would be but nice to have a glibc that does not have to do this. Um, but we don't have the support for 64-bit time yeah. t in glibc yet. So the patch that, that exists for glibc implements 64-bit time t on all architectures and then implements the fallbacks for running on older kernels. Yeah, and I thought the most of the extra mechanism there was in the fallback side of things, right? Right, but that part doesn't even have the native case yeah. yet because it okay. not mainly. Okay. Right. Um, and I don't know what uh, what else it has that you might still need. So all kinds of interfaces change in some way. That yeah, that's my big worry here is yeah. that because no one's done it before, I don't really know what I'm doing here. It's right. We're just so glibc glib glib exports some interfaces up. that contain a time t that do not correspond directly to a kernel interface. So I talked to someone in glibc land and. Uh -huh. They, they were convinced that it was possible to get rid of all of those. Okay. Like with very little work today, okay. if that makes sense, which is part of the reason that swung me towards the, hey, let's try to do it, right? Yeah. Because then if we could do the, like the whole user side of the glibc ABI uh, matching up. Um, but it sounds like it's just going too fast, if that makes any sense, right? So, okay. So maybe the right answer is to just do a 32-bit time PE. <laughs> well, the other alternative would be to miss the glibc well, cutoff. Well, that's what I'm thinking now, right? Uh, if, if we miss we the glibc cutoff, you could still have a fork uh, of the release. You can still put it out there and then merge it a month or two later when we have it all done for the following merge. So you think it will be done for the next, like it'd be it done in time for the next glibc release, right? The, it would be possible to have a... No, I mean, if we, if we don't, like, you, you're basically waiting for me for the kernel side, right? And I, I'm not completely sure I can yeah. make it. Um, if I don't make it uh, and you miss the glibc merge, like, then you have to decide whether you merge it with the 32-bit time t or you don't merge it into yeah. the glibc yeah. release. You could still miss the glibc release, merge it a month later for the next no, release. No, I agree, and that's kind of what I was... And then we wouldn't have to merge a port late in the release cycle, which is a headache, right? We'd be able to merge it early in the release cycle. Now... This is the same thing we said last release cycle is, hey, yeah. let's skip 32-bit <laughs> RISC-V and glibc and just merge it super early next time. Right. And now it's late again. <laughs> so, <laughs> so I'm a little bit worried that uh, this, this will persist so forever. Maybe, maybe what you should try and do is uh, target 229, uh, maybe start pushing patches or, or posting patches around January, which is what you're comfortable yeah. with, I believe, right? Well, we can post the patches for the 32-bit time t ABI, basically. Right. Now. And, and right. we don't necessarily need to merge it for 229. Uh, Just get it out, we reviewed the, and stuff. Yeah. The moment we cut the release, uh, when we open master, you can immediately push it in. Yeah, and there's there's no sort of staging mechanism in glibc. Unfortunately. Right? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Because that'd be really an ideal case for this, but right? Where we can so keep it near everything. So my thing with the reason I want to merge it in glibc land is that. Um, I find it really hard to maintain out of tree glibc ports because when the code base changes around, I find it really hard to figure out like what changed and what I need to reflect into my stuff. There's a reasonable amount of code copied and the build system moves and it's like, 
So <laughs> you, you can always create your own namespace branch in the repo. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and then just rebase to master. Uh, yeah. So the, the thing about the freeze is that uh, with, with Julipc, uh, post freeze, there aren't a lot of patches that go in. So the, the month that we usually okay. use yeah. up. Yeah, and there, there's not going to be any major refactoring. So that month doesn't really hurt yeah. us any then. Yeah, so your rebase wouldn't hurt that much. Yeah, so that makes sense. Yeah. The other thing to consider is that for 32-bit, glibc might not, a might not even be the most important C library because uh, you, might only, you might run on a system that only has 32 megabytes of RAM. This is another and issue. And one thing we've been doing is gating. And, and yeah, so we've been gating, marking any of the ABIs stable on glibc being in, basically. And that's what's been gating all the other C libraries from being kind of official, like muscle and uh, a stable new lib ABI. I think people are a little less worried about stable new lib ABIs. Um, but muscle's the kind of target for this sort of space. Yeah. And we have a muscle patch set out now that is just gated on us kind of pulling the trigger on uh, ABI stability, if that makes sense. Yeah. Um, and, and muscle, I think, will have a much harder time. In muscle 1.x, you will have a much harder time doing the 64-bit time t on top of that, because it's different from Yeah, we haven't looked at the, the 32-bit side of stuff there. Yes. Um, so I have a, a muscle port, as I said in my talk. Yeah, I saw, but it's um, yeah. where to change all, all that code, um, because they use a common implementation, and they have one definition of time t, which is yeah. the same as long. Yeah, yeah, which is, so that's another issue. Um, but we have been, at least for the ABI stability issue, we have been saying, hey, we're, 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 glibc is the ABI stability point uh, for RISC-V kernel ABIs, right, if that makes sense, when we get in. And that's why we're a little bit slushy with this stat x and the time t stuff. I don't want to change kernel ABIs, but... So what, uh, what's the status of StatX and glibc? Do we have implementation of stat based on StatX? I thought there was. Am I wrong about that? No, I'm just crazy. I have no idea. Okay. I'll have to look. Yeah, I thought there was, because I thought at some point StatX disappeared from our kernel and code started breaking, but maybe I'm wrong. No, there, there was a different bug. The there, different bug. Okay. Um, there was not StatX that disappeared. It was one of the old... We, we accidentally removed the, the, the old stat, so the glibc is not using stat no, x. I, yeah, I think I'm thinking of a different, different bug, yeah. if that makes sense. It, <laughs> it, it was based on that, yes. Yeah, no, no, but I think at some point I, I do remember chasing down something to a yeah. non yeah, no, Sorry about that. Stuff, so. yeah. No, no, that's <laughs> fine. <laughs> the ABI isn't stable, so. <laughs> um, I think that's the right thing to do. Okay, um, so I guess it sounds like we're just going to skip glibc this round. OK. <laughs> Good talk. <laughs> All right, yeah, sorry if that wasn't the most interesting talk to attend. It was. But it was useful for me. <laughs> All right.
chain at all. I am one of the maintainers of the Ash32 port upstream, and a lot of my work these days go, is on the uh, upstream port. Uh, so this is just going to give a brief overview of what's coming in VH1.5a, and I'll talk a bit about some of the tool chain implications of this. Um, so. Um, of the uh, V8 instruction set. Um, it's got new uh, extensions that ARM, uh, ARM has added to the instruction set. And this is sort of a list of the major features that we have in the instruction set. Um, V8.5, we will bring in uh, features like memory tagging extensions, branch target identifiers, some new random number generating instructions, uh, architecture support for, prote for improving protections with KASLR, uh, some specter and meltdown related enhancements. Uh, there'll be some floating point instructions for uh, porting code from other architectures, especially around conversion of integers and what we do with stuff in the NAND space. Um, and what, um, there will be small scale enhancements for virtualizations, uh, virtualization. So uh, we we have some new traps on cache and DLB maintenance instructions, <coughs> and there's stuff around uh, support for exception entry without context synchronization, and um, there's a cache clean instruction to a point of deep persistence, as if. Persistence wasn't good enough, we need deep persistence. Um, however, I'm not going to give you, I'm not going to try and cover all of this in the next 20 minutes. I'm going to fundamentally focus on So I'm going to start with, I'm going to cover some of the new security extensions that we have in uh, V8.5. A lot of this starts around, uh, what I'm trying to cover is basically a simplified history of uh, memory safety errors that have existed in C programs for a while. Uh, at first you could stick code on the stack, DDP put a stop to that. Now the attacker needs a new way to uh, of getting to a point of privilege ex escalation um, so that he can turn off DEP, um, which is essentially data execution protection or uh, prevention. Um, ROP and JOP are potentially during complete ways of doing that by, programming, by breaking pro program control flow integrity. Uh, what I mean by that is when somebody writes a program, they expect control flow to be in a particular manner. Uh, drop and drop are techniques that try and break that control flow integrity uh, because people end up with uh, essentially uh, generating gadgets that they're able to use to exploit uh, programs. Um, what we end what we ended up with in 8.5 is some new architectural support for limiting control flow exploits. Um, and we also tried to add some architectural support for detecting vulnerabilities. Uh, the main thing here that we're looking for is trying to help with detection of use after free type uh, errors in programs. Uh, for today, I'm only going to, I'm going to try and cover mostly uh, the techniques that, the architecture extensions that we have put in for limiting control flow exploits. Uh, as part of that, I'm going to go back a little bit, even though I said I'm going to talk about 8.5, I'm going to go back a bit, a couple of years and talk about 8.3, uh, which is where we added something known as pointer authentication. One of the applications of pointer authentication is protecting your return address. Uh, 
most return oriented programming attacks usually work by damaging the return address that is sitting on the stack. Um, what, what we have is basically the use of the return instruction to transfer control from somewhere other than the call chain by damaging the return address that's present on the stack. The, eight, uh, the fundamental idea is that drop attacks trick functions to return to the wrong place. With pointer authentication, hardware ensures that return actually happens to the correct place. Or rather, it prevents programs from returning to the wrong place. What we end up doing is essentially using the upper bits of a 64-bit pointer to hold a pointer authentication code. What this is, is essentially a signature of the return address that's, that's stored in the upper bits of the address. Um, this is added and checked by some dedicated instructions. The instructions we've added, so let's go and take an example here. A conventional program that compiles with uh, uh, pointer authentication turned on essentially introduces a couple of new instructions. One is uh, a packed IASP, which is the first instruction in the prolog, and then we've saved the uh, frame pointer and the link register on the stack. Um, and furthermore, <coughs> we've then checked just after we've loaded the value, what we are trying to do is check that the signature of the link register matches with what we signed in the prolog. It matches with what we get in the epilogue. Um, so the path IASP and dot IASP are a couple of instructions which we've added in the NOX case. This means that the instructions are backwards compatible, and therefore you can deploy these on older architectures. On RV 8.3 and beyond, we've got some of these fused instructions which try and reduce some of the code size bloat. They would end up doing the return as well as do an authenticate. They would authenticate and then return. In in this. So this, uh, this extension allows us to help prevent against drop attacks. The, uh, the other extension that we've got that's come up in V8.5 is the whole thing around branch target identifiers. One of the things, uh, the, uh, this, this, uh, extension is really to help prevent against jump oriented programming attacks. We've seen some of these examples taken in the earlier presentation. Um, the whole idea is that pages can be marked as containing BTI instructions. There's an, there's an additional bit in the page table that indicates whether the BTI instruction should behave as a knob or as that, uh, uh, or whether it should behave as a place where an indirect branch or an indirect call should lack. Uh, branching to an indirect branch to any place other than well, what is marked as a, mar what is marked with a BTI instruction will result in an exception. Now, the BTI instruction behaves as a BTI instruction only if the corresponding page table bit is turned on. Now, that's something that we've introduced in the page table format for V8.5, and therefore this is backwards compatible. So the deploy, uh, the BTI instruction is a knob unless the, uh, the page table entry for the page containing the BTI instruction uh, enables the instruction. Um, what we what we are looking to do is essentially have this is an all or nothing solution where uh, in terms of 
an ELF module. And when I speak of an ELF module, I'm referring to a shared object or an executable. All the objects in the shared object or the executable must have a marker that says that um, BDI is enabled on all of these objects. And in the end, the ELF module <coughs> will have a marker that states that uh, this is this is something, this is a module that's enabled BDI. So it's, it's an opt-in feature. Uh, even if you had, even if you ran this uh, shared object on, uh, on, an, uh, on a version of the architecture that did not contain the feature, uh, there would be no problem because the BDI instruction would behave as a NOP instruction as it is in the NOP space. Um, and that's sort of what we've done. Now, if you combine the return address authentication and BTI, you are able to protect yourself against ROP and JOP attacks on the AR64 architecture. The, going back to the example that I had in the earlier slide, we, if you had BTI and pointer authentication to, together, what you end up seeing is a BTIC instruction as the first instruction in the function, followed by something that protects your return address. And whatever the function does is fine. And then you return, uh, and before you return from the uh, um, function, you authenticate the, the value of LR. If an attacker had changed the value of LR anywhere in between, the AUT IASP guarantees that the value of LR would be suitably mangled so that the um, so that the program would trap at the point of time you had the return. This is how we are managing to achieve protection against drop and job attacks together. It sort of helps us raise the bar in that regard. Now, the observant among you might notice that we've got two instructions here which are sort of, uh, you, you have two instructions in the prologue of the function. You have an instruction which is a BTIC, you also have a PAC IASP over there. Now, you would think that two instructions that's that's essentially eight bytes. That's not going to cost much. But why do we want to bloat? So one of the things we've ended up doing is saying that the PAC IASP can also act as a valid instruction where an indirect branch can land. That, that way, we are able to protect, uh, we are able to, we have enhanced the meaning of the PAC IASP instruction in B8.5 to say that in addition to saving, uh, in addition to uh, signing the return address with the A key and the stack pointer, you're acting as a, uh, you're effectively acting as a BTI instruction. Therefore, an indirect call or could land at the PAC IASP instruction. Now, when we did this, there were a couple of challenges when we uh, <coughs> implemented uh, support for return address signing as well as BTI. One of the main challenges with return address authentication is the fact that your LR is now fundament is has been changed in a way uh, because the top bits of the LR have been modified. So the so the PAC IA so if you look at the operation of the PAC IASP instruction, what what it does is the PAC is essentially pointer authenticate with the I key with I, which is an instruction pointer. <coughs> what we call the A key, there are a number of keys that we've added. We've got an A key and a B key. And with the, we are taking the value from XN, which is a source register, 
that happens to be the SP register, the stack pointer. And we provide a signature in the top bits of the address. This is how the LR is being changed. Now, what this results in is an issue with exception handling. <coughs> in the sense that we've now got C++ fra exception frames that have um, LR which has been changed in a particular way. So what we now end up doing is we've added dwarf annotations in the dwarf ABI for ARM that allows us to mark such frames and then we go and check in the unwinder uh, whether the, the frame that's being unwound is correct, whether the LR that's being used for unwinding is correct by checking against the canonical SP value. So that way we are also protecting ourselves with attacks on the exception frame unwinder. Uh, where are you putting the door annotation? We, we, already it. It. we have uh, we put the dwarf annotations as a dwarf frame annotation. I think we are overriding one of the Spark, uh, the GNU RA state uh, value for the A key. We have a. a for the B key, we are indicating B key frames by adding another CIE augmentation character okay. in the FPE. So we are able to mark that with another uh, augmentation character. In the H frame? In the FPE. Yeah, in the H frame. In the H frame. Yeah. 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 So, uh, different question. Uh, LuaJet actually uses the upper bits of the address for some optimizations. I'm not sure exactly what the details are, but then wouldn't see, that conflict with... These are return addresses that we're using this for. This is uh, being used only for the return addresses and LR. It okay. is not for data addresses. What we are doing is changing the return address. Okay, so it won't conflict it with... It should uh, not conflict with Luajin. I, I don't I don't think I don't know the use case of Lua JIT, but usually JITs I believe squirrel away information right. in data pointers. The point to remember here is right. this is an instruction pointer, right. and it's essentially we are trying to protect the return address, and right. therefore I think it is okay. Couple things. Um, first, um, I take it this is something you have to do in your compiling. I don't. Do you expect to do this for the kernel? Uh, yes. Because uh, you just destroyed K -bret probes and uh, function graph. Uh, is just that he can take the questions about. Guess what? We're working on right now. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So yeah, because well, so I basically have to disable it once you enable function graph tracer uh, or K -bret probe. No. We, we can put the appropriate demangling and mangling in. This was why I wanted to talk to you about ftrace with regs so that we can get the appropriate salt value for the pack ASP or ASP pairs. We have a plan. Oh, sorry. I think we have a solution to that. We so, sorry. talk about that briefly, so I think we have a solution that works for that. Yeah. And also, as acting as a Linux plumber shepherd, we want a more of a discussion base. Right now, it seems more presentation based. So I'm wondering if you have more of like something to throw out more of a discussion I'm to... I'm happy to take questions at any point. Right, well, the question's one thing, but I'm saying what... The point of plumbers is basically not just showing what you've done, but basically saying, hey, uh, how do I, you know, try to get more of, uh, like, where can we go in the future, and, like, that focus base. I can get to that. Yes, okay, if you're getting to that, I just want to make sure. I can get yeah. to that as well. I can talk about one application where this is... Yeah, yeah example, but, yeah, I want... This is, yes, please. that we've been talking about is that the PLT God appears to be 
a favorite target for a number of attacks. Uh, quite a few, but not all distributions mandate full railroad and buy now at the minute. Uh, however, full railroad, I don't believe is on by default on all distros. There are some distros that mandate it. I believe there are some issues with X and correctness. Uh, and there are some people who are one who are concerned about performance issues because full railroad and bind now implies that we need to load. We need to do all the. Um, we cannot have any lazy binding for dynamic shared objects. And if you've got a large dynamic shared object, you you've got to uh, do all the symbol resolution up front, even if you didn't use the functions that you would. Yeah. So the current, uh, so the current uh, PLD sequence for AR64 looks something like this. You could, in theory, have um, a new PLD or a, a new PLD sequence that uh, that essentially used AUTIA X17, X16, which is again in the NOP space, to try to save and restore, or to try and um, to try and provide a signature for your bot PLT entry. Um, is this something that would be interesting for distros to look at? Um, there are other areas where this could be used. Virtual tables is a problem, and I don't know how to solve that particular problem where you know, people would like to attack virtual tables. Uh, but it runs into the problem that pointers are ABI. Is there something we could do to help with that? I don't know. Is there something creative that we could come up with as a solution? I really don't have a good answer for that. That's an open problem right now. Yes. Yeah. Hello. Uh, do you want this mic? VTable should be railroad, right? Like there should be read only during runtime. It should be, but what happens if you've got a situation where <coughs> some shared objects use um, pointer point authentication and others don't? So if you've got pointers that are getting passed from one DSO to another, do you have a situation where some pointers are mangled when, uh, while others are not? You have to, the, the problem is really in a hybrid or a mixed system, right? That's that's what we were thinking, and that's why we didn't have a good answer. Yeah. Yeah. All right. I think the question is more like why is that a problem to begin with? Like how is someone modifying the V table at runtime for exploit? Yeah. How? Through some, uh, through some of the attacks that are with um, the COP style attacks, if I remember correctly, or the use, you know, where somebody's got a, uh, an object. It's essentially a use after free on an object. Um, maybe we should take this offline. Sounds good. Any other questions? So just to come back in terms of the current status, uh, the return address signing with the AT is in GCC 7 onwards. Uh, the return address signing with the BT patches are under review targeting GCC 9. Uh, LLVM changes are also being reviewed upstream right now. Uh, the kernel patches for pointer signing are under review. Uh, and there's some JV work that needs to happen for pointer signing that's done. That, that will probably happen after the kernel support is done. Uh, in terms of the rest of uh, V8.58, uh, we've got basic bin util support for all of V8.58 in the latest bin utils trunk. Uh, for the branch target identification stuff, we've got some compiler patches that are being reviewed upstream. Uh, the link, there are some linker patches that are being worked on in conjunction with 
you know some of the edit changes that we have to do um, and then the dynamic linker kernel patches are still pending we haven't yet started working on that uh, in terms of another feature that i said with respect to memory tagging the assembler disassembler uh, support is now upstream uh, some gcc glibc work for that is to be done any questions <laughs> so, uh, as far as glibc work is concerned for memory tagging, uh, do you have any plans to like add support to malloc? Uh, maybe put in some scaffolding in for 229 so that we can have that early. And... Okay, so. Uh, Okay, so I'm, I'm not going to block on you for 229 at all. And will this break the unwinders? Which one? Any. Uh, I mean, this. Uh, the point assigning stuff? Yeah. Uh, it should just work out of the box. Unwinders need to be taught to handle the new warp key. Yeah, uh, yeah. That's that what has been done already in Libs. Uh, in in Libs GCC, GCC and, yeah. Uh, that has already gotten done. It's already upstream. Uh, whatever other changes we need for the VP signing will also go upstream. Okay. Any other questions? Yeah. Can you explain the BTIC instruction? How does it verify the colors? Okay. Just very basic question. as a result of an indirect branch or mm -hmm. essentially a fall through or a direct branch. So the, the, so the point is that mm -hmm. if you have to have an indirect, you can't have an, in, the, the vulnerability in a job attack right. is basically that an indirect branch is being made to go at to a label or to a program location that it was not Intended to go. So how did you generate the memory map, the, the, the tagging initially? The tagging is a separate thing. So I'm thinking of like a CFI which already exists in the kernel where the link time optimization instrument, the all the branches, right? So the callers are actually checked. So do you have any idea how to use those like together with the existing ones? I was going to answer the prior question, <laughs> which was that this does not check that at all. This only checks the class of branch used to get there. So it could be used in conjunction with existing software CFI techniques. It, it, does, it's not, it doesn't rule those out. You could have additional checks. All this prevents is branching into an arbitrary instruction in the middle of an instruction stream. It's essentially weak CFI. Of course.
Yeah, this, this was um, mostly a question about, um, we started looking at initializing stack variables all the time. Um, this is something that's come up a little bit uh, in the kernel. Um, and part of this process was, you know, looking at the C spec, padding bytes in a structure are undefined uh, as far as clearing them goes. You know, you can have an initializer and say, I want this and that initialized, or you can have an empty, you know, an empty initializer that says, that implies everything should be zeroed, um, but the padding bytes aren't actually part of that specification. Um, and they may, depending on how the machine language gets laid out, um, not get touched um, during initialization. And it would be really nice to have that be deterministic, to not have that be undefined behavior. Um, because then we can build additional constructs on top of that. We can, you know, we can ask for you know full initialization all the time, and we don't have to worry about the padding bytes. And, existing surprises in kernel and other source. Um, the padding bytes we know are initialized if there was an initializer of that variable ever, um, things like that. So it was mostly a question of what's the right approach to take to getting padding bytes not made undefined uh, for, for initialization? Since I have no idea where to start looking at that. <laughs> is it, is that not specified in GCC? My understanding is it is considered undefined behavior. Yeah, but one thing is something to be considered undefined behavior right. in general, and something else is for some specific compiler to all guarantee you that. Right. Uh, you I, I haven't encountered anyone saying that it was guaranteed to okay. be uh, initialized correctly. So that's sort of what I was looking at is, so are there test cases? Uh, so you want a memory sanitizer for the kernel? That will be down the road a bit, but um, not having, a lot of that can already be done just by specifying, oh, I have a partial initializer here, and everything else gets zeroed, but um, the specification and some of the behavior says only fields of a structure were guaranteed to be zeroed, and the padding bytes are, might be taken along for the ride in case they're, you know, the, you know, the bit width was the right size that the neighboring one says, well, we'll just do a zero extension on a, on yeah, a store uh, or whatever. Yeah, because uh, I, I think you have this kind of analysis on memory sanitizers that implement on the LLVM. It uh, yeah. check if you, the memory is not in the I mean, there are sanitizers that yeah. will do this, but I would like it as a runtime feature of just, that's no longer undefined, all padding bytes are zeroed if there is an initializer at all. <laughs> but if the padding is not defined, what is the sanitizer warning on? Exactly that you are using unutilized. Oh, yeah, exactly. <laughs> okay. Anyway, there's just a question of is there anyone who can look at this? What is the right place to start? I don't know. <laughs> Could that be a compiler option? I, I would love that. <laughs> right, so I think uh, so there are a number of questions in there, right? So one of them is uh, initialization of padding bytes alongside your local variables. Uh, I don't know, is, is, is it possible to like have a late pass which does not mask warnings that, that actually does initialization? Something that is like just before lowering to RTL or something like that. I don't know offhand, uh, but this is probably something that's best discussed on the list. Okay. Uh, and I'm sure Joseph will have an opinion on this. <laughs> and he'll probably be the right person. Okay. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. And uh, uh, he is the C front end maintainer. So okay. He'd probably be the right person to. That's so. a good starting place. Yeah. Related, uh, one thing that I had that like, people ask me before for like, um, especially if you're handling cryptography, having ability to, to like have a dead store stay because you want this value to be destructed, it's not the same thing as volatile, right? Like, I mean, the compiler can still optimize this as much as it, it wants. It can be on the registers, but like have the, the last assignment that's assigning zero, like, no, that's not bad. Like, really do zero this value. Like when, when things are going out of scope. 
Yeah, yeah. like so, so it's not just out of scope. Like you, on the C code, you write like key equals zero, right? Or you are deleting the value of this key, and the compiler is oh, that's a dead store. Right. That's probably what happened at the epilogue. Right. So you're, you're, you're yeah. Zeroing at, in the yeah. Yes, exactly. And then yeah, like the compiler says, yeah, that's that's dead. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, so yeah, like, like have like uh, yeah, have like a, some way to like, like this store is not really dead, right? I'm deleting this because if someone has an exploit somewhere, at least they can't go read my key off the red registers or like Sounds the like stack or whatever. We have yeah. a attribute. Attribute. But but that's still just memory, right? Yeah. It's, it's, yeah. It's, Way to do it. Yeah. Yeah. So it's just on the, the same idea of like there's, according to the C specs, this value doesn't matter, but just in case, can you please make it zero? Cool. Yeah, that, that's all I had. <laughs> The end result of that is that memory sanitizer no longer sees that that should have been a problem. So you're, you're right. essentially masking that. In right. Time. That was a problem. Um, I think Florian Weimer sent a, a version of this, but it didn't cover padding bytes. <coughs> but basically it said, was there an initializer for this variable at all? OK, right. now I'll, I'll perform an initialization and then move on. And that masked the, the un, uninitialized variable warning. Um, but padding bytes were still not included because it was just using a regular initializer. It wasn't like a, a full mem set of the entire area. So um, my understanding of, of Florian's of objection was, was was with respect to the compiler and not memory sanitizer. So the compiler, we can, we can probably juggle around with the passes a bit and try to make sure that we have the warning right. and then zero it out. Right. But then with, with the memory sanitizer, which is running at runtime, uh, that's right. already too late. And we That's, can't really do yeah, about uh, it. If that sort of undefined behavior goes away, then the memory sanitizer does, doesn't have anything to warn about, and that's sort of OK, because <laughs> it got initialized, <laughs> so it's OK. Um, okay. There's nothing preventing us from zeroing out the entire local variable section mm -hmm. in the prologue right. of a function. It's, sure, it's just going to be expensive. <coughs> well, I, yeah, my, my hope would be then, you know, the store optimization would go, oh, I don't actually have to write a zero to this one because I'm going to write a five here. And you would get the optimization, and most of the initializations would go away, um, which I think was Florian's approach for just, if I don't see an existing initializer, add one, and then it'll get optimized away or whatever. No, I was probably thinking of more of a brute force approach here. Yeah, the, the, people get real sensitive about performance. Uh, I, I <laughs> thought that would happen. It's actually more optimal to do, to, to zero, you know, if you have long time to potentials. Yeah, I'd, yeah. I'd love to find a good performance approach. Like, I'm, I'm fine. I'll do whatever no, anyone says. No, but still, performance still does oh, hurt yeah, yeah. when you do that. Uh, yeah, zero's fine. Zero's, <laughs> fine. zero's easiest. Um, it's mostly I just don't want ever what was there to be there anymore, <laughs> unless it's zero. Then that's okay. Yeah. Yeah, it's just. Uh, how is it going to interact with C++ when you have an uh, automatic object that cannot be zero? You need to use the default constructor, which is different than just zero the memory. Sh Should we call the constructor? 
and the structure on the app log. No, I mean, for instance, you have uh, a C class that uh, the, com the compiler would just create. You, you would have a structure entry and the structure exit. So that wouldn't be uninitialized. OK. So I guess what I'm saying is you uh, z do the zeroing when you're allocating space in the prologue. And technically, the constructor should be called after that. It should be called technically after you've allocated the space in the prologue. And that way, it, there should not be an issue. I, that's what I'm thinking right now. Okay. Yeah, okay. I don't think that should might be. make sense. Yeah. Yeah. It's just throwing out ideas. Yeah. So I'll send some questions to the list, yeah. I guess. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Um, cool. Well, thanks. Yeah. Thank yeah. Thank even even better. Send a patch with. Oh well, yeah. That's, <laughs> <laughs> that's why I'm here. If I knew how to solve it. <laughs> That will get people that objecting to your patch. Oh, yeah. No, yeah. I can. Okay, I'll send a patch. Just like, request for this, comment. Yeah. Yeah. Request, yeah. request for comment. Here's Delete a, a line. Issue. I don't know. It doesn't compile. Exactly. exactly. <laughs> it doesn't let people comment. Any other topics? Any other topics people want to discuss? Any other. Uh, any other top, topics that we publicly want to discuss? <laughs> yeah, yeah, so, so uh, yes, thank you very much for everybody attending this uh, inaugural mini conference on the tool chain. And I want to thank uh, the organizers again, Victor and HJ, Ramana and Sadesh and HJ and Carlos uh, for helping to organize this. And thanks everybody for attending and uh, participating in the discussion. And hopefully we can make this a, a regular event. So uh, thank you very much. Have a good, uh, good afternoon and uh, enjoy the rest of the conference.